excited for our next guest, actually, because he is first awesome and amazing, and you all know who he is, but it's strange for me because he's actually a really good friend of mine, and now I have to have a serious face and a serious conversation with him, but it's all to the benefit for you. So can you please join your hands together and help me welcome Pete Cashmore, CEO of Mashable, to the stage. Pete Cashmore, everybody. Can I go here? Yes, all yes. right, so what you have right here. I'm not sitting down until you sit down. There we go. If you could apply Instagram filters to this half of the stage and maybe help me improve my appearance, I'll feel a little bit more self-confident. Pete, first of all, thank you. I mean, you're a busy man. Um, Thanks so much for having me. What a, what a rise you've had. I mean, we go back to the beginning of, say, the, the, the rise of the blogosphere, definitely the rise of the technology blogosphere. Uh, can you just share your inspiration for Mashable? I mean, what were you setting out to do? Sure, so Mashable started in um, 2005. I was 19 and living in rural Scotland. I wanted to get involved in technology. The internet seemed like it was taking off. It was going to be really, really exciting. And um, I didn't really have a way into that. So I started writing about it, as a lot of people did. They blog about things they liked. And you know, within about six months or so, there were a million people reading it. And I thought, wow, this is kind of crazy. And so I started running ads, hiring people, scaling up. And every time I had a little bit of extra money, I'd, the first thing I did was had someone on the night shift, because I was in Scotland and trying to write about Silicon Valley. So you know, I, didn't, I would sleep five hours, and I'd wake up, and something would have happened, and I'd freak out. So. Um, I hired a night shift person, and then I could sleep at night, and then gradually just kind of ramped up from there. But it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's been interesting to see you know, the changes that have happened in media. It's been kind of the most transformative time for media uh, since kind of 2005. Yeah, well, you know, the, uh, the technology industry certainly was covering. There were, there were traditional news outlets covering Silicon Valley at the time. How did the traditional media industry respond to your success? Um, well, I, I actually think, um, well, media is very competitive in general, but I, I think what's interesting about media now is that, you know, everyone's competing for attention. Um, but I think generally um, people are, are looking for inspiration everywhere and, and looking to technology for inspiration and feel very kind of positive about this, this transition. Um, I think the challenge is where you have a legacy business, right? Where you, we're very lucky we don't have a legacy business that we've got to keep running, but I think those that have got to do what we're doing and have a legacy business is kind of challenging, but there are a lot of media companies doing great stuff. I mean, you're seeing innovation come out of, you know, the, the biggest, oldest institutions like the New York Times are actually coming up with cool new stuff, so um, I definitely wouldn't knock old media. All right, so since we're, we're looking at the future of media and the convergence of media, uh, there are traditional companies, like uh, have you guys seen the, the Fox clip going around where they have these big, huge, touchable screens in this new media newsroom? I mean, the yeah, the big, the big, uh, it's crazy. I thought that was fake, by the way, but I guess it's a thing. So what, what do you see businesses, traditional media businesses getting right? And also where are they still facing challenges? Well, I think the, the trick is to figure out what is um, a shiny gimmick and what is actually meaningful um, innovation. Uh, and I think in television it's hard to represent. It's always been hard. It's like in movies, you know, the social network did a particularly good job, but trying to represent the digital sphere in a very visual medium like that is challenging, right? How do you uh, make tech look cool on TV? Um, so that's really the challenge they're trying to do. I think um, whether that's meaningful innovation we'll see, it seems to be kind of a, a shiny thing, but I do like that there's a willingness to uh, involve social and it's kind of surprising when you look at you know how new all this stuff is that you know it's become the norm to have tweets on television and to have them all on tweet deck on these huge screens so I think the infiltration of, of social and digital into that has happened much faster than anyone expected do you think do you think that the integration of social though I, I look this is a personal opinion of mine but I think that when I see tweets on screen I see it as novelty um, I don't necessarily think that traditional media understands sort of what that deep integration looks like and what social really means to sort of the, the, the media industry at large. I mean, what do you see still facing, what, what are the hurdles that they still have to deal with in order to better get what this is all about? Well, I think, um, I think the, the, the way that you get social into television is to start uh, 
treating TV as the start of the conversation and start engage the reader in, you know, what do you think about this? Get a response, get uh, content submitted into television. I think that's really the next step, but it's going to be a, a long road to do that. They don't have their own proprietary technology to do it, and really for each channel, they need their own systems so that they can have their own unique content well, for instance, where they're sourcing stuff. Um, but I, I just think it's going to take time, and I think that really it's the tech companies that are building this stuff, and then the media companies are reacting and trying to integrate it. I think that's a common theme for every industry, right, is that technology happens and then we react, businesses react. And you, you said something earlier that I want to pick up on in terms of legacy. You didn't have legacy uh, to contend with, so you were able to innovate and keep innovating. How much of this in terms of traditional media is hampered by that legacy? And also, how much of it is culture and the lack of leadership or vision? No, I, th I think it's largely... Um Legacy. I mean, I think there's, there's an advantage to certainly being born into this stuff, but realistically, every six months, everything refreshes. So as long as you're on the ball, that's fine. I think. Um, I think increasingly, it's about um, the the core has always been the same, right? It's about telling stories. It's just that the way you tell stories is going to change, and that's the same as all this native advertising kind of comes to the fore as well. It's about how do you tell stories about the real world, and then how do you um, also tell stories about, um, you know, on the ad side, how do you tell real stories about brands? So um, I think it's all the same thing. I honestly do. It shouldn't be that challenging because it's the same thing it's always been. It's just different formats. It's just different ways of telling stories and communicating. And we're getting faster at it and we're getting more visual and more video and that kind of thing. But it's still storytelling and great stories are great stories. Yeah, part, of, part of what I want people to take away from Pivot is this idea that it's part creativity, it's part storytelling, but it's also a lot to do with innovation and the role that everybody in this room plays in sort of the culture of their company becoming more innovative. Uh, I admire you and Mashable for, for several reasons, one of which is that you've adapted to a lot of things and you've sort of taken leadership positions every time something new happens. So I think back to the, uh, the old days when you were head to head with TechCrunch and now you see new and new media companies like BuzzFeed sort of coming up with clever new ways to tell stories. You've been resilient all the time. The, what Mashable is today and the experience that Mashable is today is definitely not what it was two years ago, which is definitely not what it was two years before that. What's your culture, what's your infrastructure like in order to be competitive like that? There's a couple of things on that. I think um, where Mashable started was obviously, you know, technology, startups, that kind of thing. But as social took off, we realized, hey, you know, people, social is a horizontal. It's not a vertical, right? So it goes through entertainment. You know, our readers want to know what's the new TV show or what's the new uh, movie or music that everyone's going to be talking about online. They want to know, you know, what's happening in the political sphere, what's happening in business, how digital is changing all this stuff. So that was kind of a mental switch we made a couple of years in where we said, you know, what it's really about is um, social is the horizontal. It's the common thread that runs through everything. There's these social influencers online who essentially create word of mouth about everything that happens and how can we be the service to them, make them look good by knowing what's cool in advance. And we're doing, we actually, you know, we have a lot of technology plays. Like we have a technology called Velocity that predicts what's going to go viral later in the day. So we get an early heads up on that. But I think in terms of culture, it's about... Um, you know, and we're getting better at that. I think for a long time we were just kind of on the trend and now we're starting to get ahead of the trend and we're getting faster. Um, I think the way you do it is, what, what we really try and do, and we've gotten really good at it in recent years, is not be too departmental. I think there's a tendency in media companies to say, well, you know, this is the community and you manage the social networks and this is the editorial and you write the stuff. And um, you know, you're the product department, so you build tech stuff. And really, it's more about uh, how do you keep it very small and keep those all interlinked, so that, for instance, you know, your editorial feeds into your community. You know, it's, if you're not writing the right stuff that people want to share and consume on social networks, then you're really not doing a great job. So we're a lot more integrated across all departments um, than I think most media companies are. We don't try to draw clear barriers. We try and have a lot of uh, integration cross departmentally. One of the things that you said that I would love for us to better learn about is this idea of word of mouth, right? I mean, obviously in a social economy, it's all about sharing experiences. It's all about word of mouth and conversations. I'm going to share a pet peeve I have, not of Mashable, but just in traditional media in general. And that is when I'm reading a fascinating story 
it's not just about consuming content like it used to be. It's not just about eyeballs, right? It's about how someone read it and then how someone shared it and then what happened. I think this is sort of like performance metrics now that needs to fold into editorial. And one of my pet peeves is that when I want to share an article, say on Twitter, that the headline alone is like 220 characters and I have to go and edit down the headline in order to share it. And I feel like that's not my job. I feel that something as simple as thinking through what should make it more shareable should be commonplace. And that's true for any content that we create. So over the years, it's not just about what you can tweet. Now we're changing how storytelling is happening, right? How, how many characters do you have to tell a story and grab someone's attention? And, and now how many gifts could you put into a post? I mean, how is this all evolving? So, so there's, a couple, there's a couple of threads there. One is, um, media companies absolutely are optimizing for sharing now. It's, it's, a, it's a sea change where people have gone from optimizing for search to optimizing for sharing, and that's happened over the last couple of years. We certainly do a lot of that. We think about, you know, how do we first of all write the kind of stories that our readers want to consume and share? And then secondly, how do we package that so that it's easy to consume and then easy to share? And I think you're absolutely right. The world is going more visual. It's, it's not necessarily, it doesn't have to go towards uh, all animated GIFs or um, all um, purely visual and short video, but um, there are different formats that are more creative, that tell the story in a different way, and that are easier to consume on social networks. So I think um, in terms of storytelling, the formats are changing. Obviously, video is going to rise up. Obviously, you look at mobile consumption. You look at what's easiest to consume on these devices. Is it short snippets of text? Is it um, video? Is it, um, you know, is it GIFs and short animations? Is it Instagram photos? What, how do you tell stories? And I think. That's just going to evolve. The answer is probably all of the above. I think you can still, though, and I think that's really important, you can still tell long-form stories. And we're seeing this counter trend as well in media where it's not just about the short, snappy, snackable stuff that you can consume uh, in five seconds and share out to your network. It's also a lot about um, how do you tell deep, meaningful stories and be differentiated. Because it's really important for media companies that there are articles, and it's important to us that this article is on Mashable where people really say, wow, did you see that article on Mashable, right? Because I think there's a commoditization that can happen as people be become this more short, snackable content that, is, um, that becomes more of a commodity, frankly. So we kind of do both. We look at, okay, how do we tell really snappy stories that are very shareable, but also where's this long form trend going and how can we tell meaningful, deeper stories and really get behind the story? Um, and I think, People are consuming in both ways. It's more of a time of day thing. It's like certain times during the day you'll want the mobile short snappy stuff, but maybe on a Sunday you want the longer form, you want a long read, you want to really understand a topic. So uh, it's not purely going towards the short stuff and it's not purely going towards um, visual, but, but there's a kind of a balance to be struck. With the, minute, with the minute we have left, I have two super important questions. The first is, can GIFs be successful without cats or dogs? So the rebel mode yeah, I mean we do breaking bad gifts and they work great. Madmen, madmen, gifts. You got to get it right, gifts. That's they sent it to me, Amy. Hands for gifts. For a little while ago. Or hands for gifts. See if we can get it. Super long. I know. Even the guy who invented it said it's gifts. And then you get real time marketing for gifts. We can figure out another topic to that later. Which I thought was brilliant, by the way. But the last question, and in all seriousness, is. Uh, native is a big deal now, right? So Great. it's a monetization I'm strategy, a and I've so talked to a do ton of brands, that, and they're all over break, the map. And then I'll do the What's the best advice you can give to brands on how to That'll be more successful That'll give you a chance to get the file. Well, I mean, I think it comes back to telling real right. stories. Right. Um, but I think yeah. the key thing is what we do, now, and we call it, we have a fancy phrase, it's thematic alignment. It's basically, don't talk about your stuff, you know? It's very easy. So we do native in two ways. One is we do branded content, which essentially, brand will come to us and say, we really care about innovation like to get in cities. So we want to talk about urban innovation. Our brand 10, is a car company, 10, for instance, but 20. we want people in cities to love our cars, so write about the future of cities, but don't talk about our brand, don't mention our products. You know. And when they understand that, they get a lot of positivity from it, because it's kind of like, it's maybe, you know, it's like the PBS model. It's like a sponsorship model, where you essentially get some great content, and you say, wow, well, isn't it cool that that brand basically gave me that stuff right. ad-free. You know, it's a great positive thing. And then 
Secondly, one of the things we do is called social lift, which is we actually allow brands to take their Instagram photos and their YouTube videos and any other content, vines, all the new stuff they're making, and place it on our site. Uh, we disclose it as sponsored, and then we let our readers share it and engage with it. And it does incredibly well. Readers actually, when you create great, compelling, engaging content, people share it. So we have shareable advertising as well. So I think it's about your advertising needs to be as shareable and as compelling and as engaging as the content around it.